Welcome back. I've officially moved cross country, an experience which one could call a nightmare due to the complications with the moving company we paid to make it an easy process, or so we thought. Regardless, I've got all my stuff now, and though I couldn't stick to my upload schedule, it's been a relief to see my channel continue to grow in my absence, so thank you. Now for today's video, we're covering the long-awaited Celtic mythology. Not the Celtics, that's the basketball team, but the Celts, as in the collection of Indo-European tribes connected through their culture and roots. The Celts dwelt all across Europe, spanning from Spain and the British Isles all the way to Asia Minor. Their languages and beliefs differed by region, but Celtic is the blanket term used to describe them nonetheless. When most people look into Celtic mythology, they no doubt come across what is largely Irish mythology, like the gods of the Tua de Danann, which make up a large part of the gods we will cover today. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 1. The Dagda The Dagda is the chief of the Tua de Danann, the tribe of the gods in Irish mythology. He is not only portrayed as a king, but as a divine father figure and a powerful druid. He is often associated with fertility, agriculture, masculinity, and physical strength, and druidism, which was especially prevalent in Celtic culture. His name, while unique to him, was also a sort of title, thus we say THE Dagda, and not just Dagda. His wife, the Morrigan, follows the same denomination. Before we go further, I should clarify that the Tua de Danann are believed to have been the actual people who settled in Old Ireland long ago. They were not the first, or even the last, but their stories became legend, and now many are seen as gods, though more in a sense of deification, rather than drawn from natural phenomena like in other cultures. Anyways, in many tales it was believed the Dagda could control life and death, weather and crops, and time itself. The Dagda is described as a large, bearded man, dressed in a hooded cloak. He wields a magic staff, or sometimes a mace or club, with the dual nature of one end for taking life, and the other to give life. He also owns a large cauldron that never empties, and in other stories he owns and plays a magic harp to control emotions and change seasons. The name the Dagda means the great god or the good god, and these titles are carried through diverse myths of creation and battle, where he's described as a wise and just king who also happens to have some pretty wild powers at his disposal. Between his wife the Morrigan and secret lover the river goddess Born, he had six children. The Norse likened him to their god Odin, and the Romans to Despater, who later became Pluto. Number 2. The Morrigan the Morrigan is the Great Queen, or Phantom Queen, of the Tua de Danann. Mor is derived from the Indo-European root for terror or monstrousness, like the Old English Mare, which we still see in the word Nightmare, and in the Scandinavian slash Old East Slavic Mara, or Mora, which literally means Nightmare. Meanwhile, Regan is simply translated as Queen, compiling Mor Regan into a scholar's favor to be Phantom Queen. She's largely a prophetic goddess of war, and was commonly beseeched in the foretelling of doom, death, or victory in upcoming battles. Her symbol is the crow, a symbol which inspired warriors in battle and instilled fear in her enemies. The Morrigan is often portrayed washing the blood-stained clothes of those fated to die. Pretty intense. Interestingly enough, some tales also refer to a trio of sisters known as the Morigna, their names being Baith, Maha, and the Morrigan. The Morrigan was the cunning and envious wife of the Dagda, and had some druidic powers of her own, primarily her abilities as a shapeshifter. In later Irish folklore, she came to be associated with the Banshee, adding to her already imposing aura of fear about her. I find it fascinating how the Queen of the Tua de Danann was also seen as a terrifying prophetess, and the ability to shapeshift almost makes her seem tricksy like the Norse Loki though I assume she's far too serious for the likes of him. As a big fan of Dungeons & Dragons, I think a dark and shadowy druid who uses ghostly powers of seership to guide their party and scare their enemies would be dope. Number 3. Oma Oma was the Dagda's brother. That's all, folks. Just kidding. Oma was the god of speech and language, as well as eloquence and learning. He's the divine creator of Oham, the script in which Irish Gaelga was first written. The name Oma comes from the Proto 
Indo-European, that's a mouthful, roots ak or ag, which mean to cut, as Oham, the script, was cut into wood or stone. He's described as a shining, radiant strongman, a champion of the Tuatha in their battles against the Firbolg, another tribe which inhabited ancient Ireland. He was also said to be skilled in speech and poetry, with the Oham script as proof of his ingenuity. Oma existed in other Celtic cultures under the name Ovmios, who resembled an elderly Heracles with the persuasive powers to bind men to himself. He wore long, thin chains connecting his tongue to the ears of his followers. I can't help but connect the aspects of Oma to the Daedric god Hermaeus Mora from the Elder Scrolls and his artifact the Ogma Infinium, a book of vast knowledge written by a powerful wizard. For those who've played the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, you may remember a pretty crazy exploit the developers had to remove to keep the game as balanced as they could. Number 4. Boen. Boen is the goddess of the river Boen. She is the wife of Necton, the god of the spring from which the river Boen flows, or in other tales, Elkmar, the lord of horses and chief steward of the Tua de Danon. Her relationship with the Dagda was a popular tale wherein Elkmar is sent on a one-day errand while Boen is impregnated by her secret love, the Dagda. Upon Elkmar's return, the Dagda uses his powers to make the sun stand still, so the seeming lack of progress hid Boen's pregnancy from her husband, until nine months later when she gave birth to a son, Angus. The name Angus is believed to mean one desire because the Dagda had been Boen's one true desire. The tale overall is believed to represent the winter solstice in Newgrange, the prehistoric monument which overlooks the river Boen, as during the solstice the sun, the Dagda, enters the inner chamber of the structure, Boen, when the sun stands still. In legends where she's married to Necton, who some say is another name for Nuada, who we'll cover shortly, she indirectly creates the river Boyne when she walks up to the magical well of Sigeus, despite being forbidden to do so by her husband. The well was surrounded by a ring of hazelnut trees which she walks under as she circles the well, causing the waters to surge forth, carrying Boyne out to sea as the waters violently beat against her. Because of the sudden power of the surge, she drowns. Yep, that escalated quickly. If you've made it this far, then please like the video if you're finding all this as interesting as I do, and feel free to leave a comment about a reference you caught from the gods we've covered so far. I love seeing inspiration spread across diverse fandoms, and if there's other cultures you want me to cover in future videos, let me know in the comments too. Number 5. Noada Argetlam As previously mentioned, Noada, also known as Nectin or Elkmar, was a husband of Born and king of the Tua de Danon before their migration to Ireland. His title Argetlam means the silver hand, or arm, due to the loss of his limb in battle against the Firbolg, which cost him his kingship until he was healed by the power of Dian Kecht, replacing his flesh with silver in the process. The initial loss of his kingship came down to a rule that the king of the Tua de Danon must be physically perfect, which is why his rank was restored following the magical restoration of his lost limb. Afterwards, Nuada reigned for another 20 years. In Welsh mythology, Nuada is known as Nud, or Lud of the Silver Hand, and an even earlier form of Nuada was Nadan, a Celtic god of healing, hunting, and fishing, worshipped by the ancient British and the Gauls. It is thought that the Tolkien character Celebrimbor, whose name means Silver Hand in his own tongue, the elvish smith who forged the first rings of power, was inspired, at least in name, by Nuada Argetlam. Number 6. Epona. If you've ever played a Zelda game, this name should already resonate with you, and unsurprisingly, Epona is a Celtic goddess of horses. Particularly worshipped in the Gallo Roman religion, Epona was primarily the goddess of fertility, but her iconography shows her either riding a horse or tending to them, as she was particularly the protector of the Equin family. The name Epona is Gaulish in origin, yet inscriptions about her were not only made by Celts, but by Romans and even Germanic tribes. She had a unique role in funerary rites, making her out to be a guardian of the soul and linking her to the afterlife, and she's noted as the only Celtic deity to have such widespread worship in ancient Rome, for whom she was also a patroness of cavalry. Number 7. Taliesin 
Taliesin is another example of a mytho-historical character, much like the gods of the Tua de Danann. Taliesin the man was a Welsh poet and bard who lived around the 6th century AD. He was believed to have sung at the courts of three kings and was renowned for his various works. In Celtic myths and Arthurian legends, he was seen as a powerful magician and a seer, given the title Taliesin Bain Bert, or Chief of Poets. According to legend, he foretold the death of King Melgen, sorry, this is tough, uh, King Melgen uh, Gwynedd by the Yellow Plague, also known as the Justinian Plague. In later stories, he became a legendary hero and companion to King Arthur himself. Though not as much of a god as some of the previous entries on this list, it's still clear what an impact Taliesin had on early Britannic cultures. From what was essentially a normal bard produced such fantastic works and feats that his legacy became so legendary, he was like a god of bardic tradition. And the name Taliesin should also be quite familiar to any D&D fans out there. Number 8. Gwyn Apnud. Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, was one of the original four lords who helped in the defeat of the dragons which began the Age of Fire. Oh, um, no, wait, that's not right. Gwyn Apnud comes from Welsh mythology this time. He was the king of the fairy folk in the Welsh otherworld, Anwen. Gwyn Apnud is described as a black-faced warrior and great hunter. He also has ties to the Wild Hunt, a folklore motif found in cultures and stories across the whole of Europe. The Wild Hunt is thought to be a sort of catastrophic event carried out by the souls of the dead as hunters in some sort of war or plague. In many early tales, Gwyn Apnud was a foreboding, powerful figure who commanded great hosts and was commonly associated with the End Times or Judgment Day. I'm not sure if beyond name he was any inspiration to Hidetaka Miyazaki, the lead game designer for Dark Souls. But whether or not you're a Dark Souls fan or not, this is pretty cool stuff. Well, this video was probably the trickiest I've worked on to be honest. Not just from delays of our horrible moving experience, but also just the time it took me to properly research all of these gods. What you watched was actually my third attempt, as there's just so many different stories and routes I could have taken. I couldn't settle on which one felt right. If you can't tell, I put a lot of thought and effort into these videos, combining a mix of my talents to bring them to you, which is often very draining for me, and in some cases, kind of a waste if the video doesn't perform. But you live and you learn, and I feel that what I learned in the process of making these videos makes up for any dips in channel growth. Anyways, I thoroughly enjoyed my research for this video. Not only was it cool to learn about the interconnected web of history and mythology, but I also traced my own ancestry directly to the Celtic Boy tribe, who dwelt in what are now modern Switzerland, Bavaria, Bohemia, and other regions. After the Iron Age, most of them on the southern side were assimilated into the Roman Empire, while those more northern were chased out by my wife's Slavic ancestors, funnily enough. If you're interested in learning about Slavic mythology, check out this video on Slavic creatures. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you for more feudal facts very soon.